Welcome back, everybody, to Hoops HD. This is our continuing four podcasts simultaneously night. Uh, I'm your host, Chad Sherwood. Rocco Miller from Bracteer.org below me. John Titel to my side. David Griggs is over there, over there, something. I'm, I'm right here. Uh, I'm right here. If you're here for the American Preview Show, you missed it. It's up there. Yep. If you're here for the Mountain West or the West Coast, you're too early. They're down there. If you're here for the Atlantic 10, though, you're in the right spot. Uh, okay. If you're here for any other conference, then way, way up there, season preview. Too. <laughs> uh, but uh, this is the Atlantic 10 preview show. We're going to be talking about anything and everything about what's going to be happening in a fascinating Atlantic 10 conference that may have just taken a bit of a dip preseason with some injuries. But uh, I want to start off, and uh, John, let me start off with you with a team that I absolutely love heading into this season, and that's Mark Schmidt's Bonnies. Yeah. They are going to be fantastic. They got a ton of guys coming back, including, I think, the best big man, if not player, in the conference in Osano Sanai, the conference reigning defensive player of the year and conference tournament MVP. He's got a wingspan of 7'8". That's not good for college. That's good for the NBA and bigger than most wingspans in the NBA. He had 15 points in the loss to LSU last March. Um, they also bring back a ton of seniors in the backcourt, Kyle Lofton, Dominic Welch, Jalen Attaway, Jaron Holmes, Mark Schmidt's been there 15 years. He's the defending conference coach of the year. This is their year to make the leap from good to great. I, I love that comp, that comment there. Great. Uh, Rocco, I'm looking at a protected seed type of team here from what on paper, at least. Protected seed. Okay. Protected well, seed, like a four seed. Not, I say the one seed. I'm saying like a four seed. Yeah. I mean, well, it's, it's interesting. I actually did a little research the last five, eight, 10 chances. Uh, uh, yeah, research. Why uh, would why would you ever do research? Yeah, just add some spice to the show. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, um, twenty twenty Dayton obviously an anomaly uh, for this league would have been a likely one seed if we got to that selection Sunday. Um, but outside of that, last year's Bonnies won won the double. They they did uh, uh, regular season championship, won the tournament championship. Still only got a nine seed. Uh, twenty nineteen VCU an eight. Twenty eighteen URI a seven. 2017 Dayton a seven. So typical typical A10 year, you're looking at a seven to nine seed. Uh, the Bonnies lose their entire bench this year. All five starters back, as John said. But I don't see how it's a, a huge jump to like a four seed. Personally, okay. uh, I think there's gonna there should be the favorite. Uh, I, I do think they'll win this league, but but they're gonna have to do something big in the non-conference. They got a shot against UConn. They're in the Charleston Classic. They're going to have to really show up in those tournaments to uh, to move the needle. I, I realize that this isn't quite the same thing, Rocco, but I'd kind of like to respond to that with my own observation. I, I don't know it, how exactly this would translate into a seed, but I think, and you see this again in, in what you would call the regular multi-bid leagues that we're talking about Morning. now, you see this a lot to where there's one or two teams, in this case, one, that's... Mm -hmm better than the rest of the league by quite a bit. And there's some decent teams that are left in the league, but nobody as good as the Bonnies. And I know that they're in the rankings now in the twenties. I, I think that's where they're starting out, which is six, yeah. seven range, right in six, seven seed range, excuse me, right. What you're describing, but what can happen with a team like that is that they just almost move up by default because they're just winning and winning and winning and winning and teams and stronger conferences might be playing each other and losing. Is this one of those teams like, you know, that uh, San Diego state did and Nevada did the one year and that by the end of the season, this St. Bonaventure team is ranked six or seventh. And if that's the case, then where do you put them? I realize that ranking does not always translate in the seed. I want, I want to say Murray state was finished the season ranked fifth six. or sixth one year and got a six seed got a so six, to yeah. your point that could happen but if the bonnies are ranked that high which is very plausible that they could be at the end of the year do you really think they would not be a protected seed yeah i, I it's a good question i think nowadays especially after what we saw last year uh, when it comes to seeds it's all about uh, the predictives so yeah. if ken, if ken palm if sagrin they're all saying they're top 10. They're probably going to be a protected seed, like regardless, because um, uh, they'll stack rank that way. But uh, just from an opportunity, you know, traditional bracketology concepts of scheduling, their big chances are UConn and Newark. They got Virginia Tech in the Hall of Fame shootout, Charleston Classic, which 
you know, they actually just play Boise in the first game. Then it's Clemson or Temple. A little disappointing for their semifinal if they beat Boise. And then the best possible team in the finals, like West Virginia, Marquette will miss. It's not that strong compared to what a typical Charleston tournament is. And then all their other tough games are home with Northern Iowa, solid. Buffalo, yeah. solid. But it's not like it's not like they're going to go to an SEC place on the road or they're going to go to a Big Ten place on the road. They unfortunately don't have those capabilities. Uh you know, the ceilings like the UConn game, Virginia Tech, and maybe a Charleston game or two. Anyway, let's let's move on below the, beyond the bodies. And first of all, I want to take a moment here to, to welcome uh, Matt Zakowski in as well. We'd have a fifth face showed up there on the screen. Sure. Uh, and Matt, why don't I just go right to you with, that, with the next thing I want to discuss, which is uh, Chris Mooney's Richmond team with four of these COVID seniors coming back. And uh, Jake Gilliard, who could become the all-time steal record this season, uh, uh, how good is this Richmond team? If, if they stay healthy, everyone comes together. They should be very good and probably in the tournament and maybe even wearing home uniforms in the first round. But that requires everyone to stay healthy and match and play like they did that opener last year against Kentucky when everyone thought, hey, this is a top 20 level team. But fortunately, it did, it did continue on that way due to injuries and other circumstances. Yeah. And, uh, uh, Injuries, did, COVID pauses. Did, did David, yeah, I mean, Nick yeah. Schrott is back now, but um, and, and the like, yeah, yeah. I mean, can this Richmond team challenge the Bonnies for for, for first place? Even no, uh, okay. I, I I like them a lot. Uh, I I know I like Richmond every year in the podcast. That's probably why you went to me, and they always never seem to be as good as I think they're going to be. But here I am again, not learning my lesson. I do like them a lot. I like them as an NCAA tournament team. They're one of the two that I'm picking to get there, but they are not as good as the Bonnies. The Bonnies are protected seed good. Okay. Uh, <laughs> beyond these two teams, uh, John, as of about a week ago, I thought we had a third team that was right up there with them in St. Louis, but uh, that may have changed with what's happened to Perkins. Yeah, I'm actually going to seed the Florida Matt for uh, a St. Louis update, if that's okay. Yeah, that's the one I okay. have is unfortunately yeah, Perkins tore his ACL, so it's not just for a little while. That's the rest of the year, and that 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 might be early curtains on Slew's tournament hopes. Yeah. Um, well, well, John. So let me throw it out there. Uh, any shot now without Perkins, who was who was their top player, and he's now gone for the year. It's hard to think so. I mean, he scored twenty one in the NIT loss to Mississippi State last year. He was the conference sixth man of the year in twenty twenty. Um, they still have plenty of talent in the backcourt with DeAndre Jones, Rashad Williams, Fred Thatch Jr. And I like Travis Ford, but uh, it's losing too big a piece to contend with the Richmonds and the St. Bonnies of this league. Yeah, I, I'm kind of with you there. It's really disappointing because I, I, I would have loved to have seen all three teams in the race there. Yeah. Um, Rocco, let me ask you this. If we're not going to count St. Louis, who else can contend to the top three or four spots in the league there? Yeah, so my my team would be Dayton is, is the uh, direct benefactor of – not only St. Louis injuries, but another team I'm sure that's coming soon. Um, and I'm only saying Dayton because they've got, you know, I was talking on a couple of shows last week about these freshman to sophomore leaps that are, that are pretty possible or even likely. So Mustafa Amzo last year was one of the best freshmen in the A-10. He's got that freshman to sophomore leap potential this year. You had Tumani Kamara, who I thought at Georgia last year, really carried Georgia on his back, even though they didn't win a lot of games, he kept things competitive, double, double guy towards the end of the year. Now he's going to come to a, 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 you know, a little bit of a weaker league than the sec. I think he's going to be awesome. And then Deron Holmes, their best recruit is also a front court guy. So the front court is absolutely loaded. Might be the best front court uh, besides St. Bonaventure in the league should be uh, back court is where all the question marks are. So is an RJ Blakeney plus Elijah Weaver. Uh, you know, some of these guys have a lot of question marks. They're going to need somebody to step up in the backcourt, probably two people to step up in the backcourt to make it a complete team, but they're going to rebound the ball. They're going to give people matchup problems and there's talent, a lot of talent. So I, I think Dayton uh, should assume that third spot, but we'll see. Uh, Rock was going with Dayton as the third spot. Uh, Matt, do you have somebody else or do you agree with him? No, I like it. I was going to think about Dayton. Yeah. Okay. I know the Durant Holmes recruit personally, because it, it looked at them like he was going to Marquette. And all of a sudden, nope, he decided last minute, and I think probably wisely for him, given that the coach that recruited him is gone now, <laughs> they decided to go with David after all. Uh, uh, John, what about what about 
Rhode Island, maybe. Uh, you bring in uh, Ishmael El Amin from Ball State, who scored 16 points a game there. You got the the Mitchell brothers down low, the twins. Uh, you know, there's a little bit there, isn't there? Even without Fats Russell. You are correct. There is a little bit there. Um, okay. Unfortunately, <laughs> there is not enough there. Um, the loss of Fats is going to be a huge loss, um, ironically. Um, David Cox seems like a solid coach. Uh, he was an assistant to John Thompson III at Georgetown. And I like El Amin. I liked his dad more, though. Um, and the schedule is manageable with a couple Big East teams. Uh, well, one in Providence. And they have a couple of games in Daytona Beach. But uh, I just don't think that uh, they're – I think they're a serious notch below some of the teams you already mentioned. Uh, David, VCU was in the NCAA tournament last year. Should we be discussing them this season? Uh, they uh, made it. Uh, unfortunately, they probably the biggest disappointment, the, the last great disappointment of what had been a year's worth of disappointments after disappointments. They didn't get the chance to play, as, uh -huh. we, as we all know. I, I definitely think they're worth paying attention to. If you are asking me, to pick whether or not I think they'll get in. My answer is that they won't. But having said that, I think they got a chance. Well, uh, we, I guess we, they're one of those mid-level NIT teams that uh, we talked about on the American show up there, if you, if you want well, to. Look. But, but I mean, Rocco, we, we've, this, this season team's already being crushed by injuries. Uh, yeah. So, and, and Watkins both. Right. And McAllister, right? So, okay. yeah. So three, three key injuries. There's a chance Baldwin gets back by February. Um, you know, you got to like the pedigree of the VCU program. They're going to, they're going to get the fans back. I mean, I don't know if a new team in the league is going to benefit from that more than VCU. Um, you know, my old buddy, Marcus Deshaun is coming over from UW. He's now going to have to start. Uh, the kid's got a ton of talent, but there's some nights he just doesn't show up. Maybe with coach Rhodes being a, probably a better coach than what UW has that could help him stay focused throughout the year. Um, curious to see how that plays out. Vince Williams, you know, potential all, a10 guy. Um, there's still some pieces there. Levi Stockard's still around. So, um, and, and I just think it's with Rhodes, whatever their record is in February, I think you can throw it out the window. They're, they, they're probably going to be pretty tough by March and a tough out. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, Matt, uh, you see anything in Davidson? Well, Bob McKillop is a pretty darn good coach, but uh, is there an, an, anything here where they can make a little noise in this conference? Yeah. Unfortunately for Davidson, what I see is their best player now plays at uh, Rupp Arena. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's about that's about yeah. it. I'll tell you what. Uh, we, I mean, we're getting down to the dregs here of the conference, unfortunately. Uh, John, let me go back to you though. I, I want to ask you about, about another team here, uh, Kim English, uh, the new head coach here at George Mason. Up, oh, John, you're on mute though, so I don't have you. See if we can get you back here. And that, that oh, is, back. I, he we better go. have his team ready from day one because I will be in Fairfax on November 12th to see my Penn Quakers in person for the first time in a couple of years. Can't wait. Um, English has an amazing track record. Played for Frank Haith and Mike Anderson. Worked for Rick Barnes and Tad Boyle. This guy knows how to coach basketball. Patriots lose four starters from last year. They have not made the tournament since 2011. They do have a surprising amount of tournament experience from last year somehow. Two transfers, Deshaun Schwartz from Colorado. He played for Tad Boyle, who Kim English used to work for, and he scored 13 points in their loss to Florida State last March. They also bring in Devin Cooper. He had 21 for Moorhead when they lost to West Virginia in March. And you got Devontae Gaines from Tennessee, also in the tournament last year, right? So, yeah, I mean, I think this, I, I think this George Mason team is uh, probably a year or two away, but already what English is doing, I agree with John. Pretty exciting stuff. Uh, he, he's certainly one of the up and comers uh, in in the industry, and this is a home run hire for George, George Mason, I think. And you know, if he sticks around three, four years, they're probably going to taste the tournament. Uh, I'd say absolutely one for the future. So, you know, he has a commitment from a top hundred kid nationally, and Justin Fernandez. Exactly. That, yeah. That's just that not the level of kid Mason's got it in. I don't even think they're getting that those level of kids under Laredega. Exactly. Yep. Uh, David, I, I thought there was a couple of coaches here that I really would have thought were going to start building programs this in this conference. Matt McCall at UMass, Keith Dambro at Duquesne. I'm not seeing much from either one of them this year. Are you? Not this year. Keith Dambro uh, had been incrementally improving Duquesne. Now, we have to put into context what that means. They were around 250-ish <laughs> in the Ken Palms and Power rankings, and he had them into the hundreds and even top 100 
the last couple years. I, I, I want to say they were in the 120s last year and the 90s before that. That is a lot better, but it still isn't to the point to where you would look at them and say, man, that, that team's really getting good. And I don't think that that progressive improvement will improve this year. I, they're kind of in a reset mode. I think they they had a little bit of a roster overhaul, but uh, he is making them better, but is he making them you know, better to the point to where you have faith that they're going to get there someday to where they're either an NIT or NCAA tournament team. I, I don't know. No, I don't know either. Uh, John, I want to ask you about three, th- throw three teams quickly at you. You've got some Philly ties. I know we got St. Joe's list. we haven't discussed also George Washington in your backyard there. Uh, anything to watch on any of those three teams this season. <laughs> Uh, for GW, they do have a nice transfer from LSU and mm-hmm. James Bishop, who was good last year. He might make the leap and be a first team all conference player this year. Um, unfortunately, the cupboard's pretty bare. So if you're playing GW, I highly recommend triple teaming James Bishop. <laughs> yeah, uh, not looking for much out of LaSalle. St. Joe's Taylor Funk is going to be a big, it's going to score a ton of points. Uh, he may even lead the league in scoring, honestly. He scored a 17.4 last year, but I don't think they've got enough. Um, by the way, just as a side note, Fordham is in this league. They have a new new head coach and Kyle Neptune, but that's all we're going to discuss about them for the entire okay. season. So on that yeah, note, they're, they're in New York. They bring the New York market. Uh, I want to run through each of you here. I ask you a series of questions. Number one, who's going to win the conference? Number two, how many teams are, are going to make, going to make it out of this conference? Number three, are there any other final thoughts, thoughts about the A-10? And John, let me start with you. I'm setting the over under a two and a half and I'm going under with the Bonnies and Richmond. I do not think Dayton or Davidson and now St. Louis have enough to make the leap, but we'll see. Um, I think the Bonnies take it, but I would not sleep on Richmond. They have so many good seniors. And I think that we're going to see Jacob Gilliard end up as the greatest steals guy in the history of the sport. As far as a fun fact, I think I'm going to go with Kyle Neptune, who I agree is not going to do anything this year at Fordham. He's at a school that hasn't made the tournament in 30 years, for God's sake. But he won not one, but two championships as an assistant to Jay Wright at Villanova. So given time, I think this guy might be able to turn things around or at least point them in the right direction. All right. Matt, how about you? So, yeah, I actually agree that I'll have two teams in. The so one dated man, if you told me they had great guards and a questionable front court, I'm like, that could be a winning formula. The other way around, it's hard. You need the guard play. So I'll go with this, yeah. The bodies winning the league, Richmond maybe being a game or two behind. And this is one where I can see, like, the bodies being something like 16-2, and two, Richmond like 15-3, and 14-4. And, and then the next place, team being 10 or 11 wins. The one interesting story I'll name is Jordan Hall at St. Joseph's, who was going to go to transfer check to St. but decided, nope, I'm going to stay home after all, go to St. Joe's, and, and he might be the NBA scouts' favorite player in this league. And that, that I don't know what he's going to do to help St. Joe's win a ton of games, but one to watch, I think, on their team. Uh, Rocco, how are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm mostly there with Titel in terms of bids. Um, I, in fact, right now I've got it at one and a half. I've got Bonnie's clearly in and Richmond in a play-in game. Uh, we'll see if that shifts by next week. I'm still uh, finalizing. But uh, Dayton and and uh, is probably the only team I could see at this point uh, it's getting in if, if all things break right. However, you know, the, my dark horse is Rhode Island. I, I do like this, this core of players defensively. Um, the only thing I don't trust is David Cox. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, uh, he, he just, since Hurley left, he hasn't been able to, to prove it. It's been a lot of disappointing seasons with Fats Russell there, a lot of talent. They just haven't done anything offensively. Um, I think this could be a really good defensive team. If somehow maybe maybe some coaching shifts, philosophy changes uh, could get them over the hump. But there there is an opportunity for a, for a team like a Rhode Island in the middle to make that leap, especially with these injuries. So I'm curious to see who's gonna who's gonna take that quantum leap this year. Yeah, uh, I, I'm along with with all of you here. The Bonnies is the champion. Richmond in is the second team. Let's not completely forget about St. Louis. Uh, the guy like Francis Socorro coming over from Oregon, if he, he was supposed to be a stud, if he can turn into that, there may be ways that they could still get themselves in the picture here, even without Perkins. So let's not just write them off completely is all I'm saying. Uh, yes. David, how about you? Um, it, it chalk, as far as the committee, as far as our panel goes, I have the Bonnies running away with it. 
and being way up in, in on the first ballot. And I've got Richmond inside the bubble. And I, I don't think anybody else gets into the field. Uh, I suppose if VCU somehow gets healthy, although I don't think they will, or like you said, St. Louis, if they can basically dominate the other 11 teams in the conference and maybe steal a win from the Bonnies of Richmond and hold their own out of conference, they might be on the bubble and maybe sneak into the field. But I'm going to go with two. I guess my thought on the A-10 is that other than the Big East, it is probably the biggest basketball-centric conference. It, it doesn't play football. At least, I mean, there's schools in the conference that have football, but it, it's as a conference, it doesn't sponsor football. But it's also extremely scattershot. You have people playing basketball at all various levels and with very different levels of commitment. I know that that's kind of the case to the point with all four leagues that we're talking about today, but the idea that you have Fordham, who is barely a top 250 team ever, a, a team that if you were to dump them in the NEC, I don't think they would win it most years or any years in a league with a team that could end up with a protected seed. It's just this almost feels like a cluster sometimes more than a conference. Uh, I guess on that note, that that's a perfect spot to end this end this uh, league. If you were looking for the American, it is up there, Mountain West of the West Coast. It's down there, and the other conference way up there. But this has been our leg Ted preview. I'm Chad Sherwood, John Titel to one side, David Griggs the other, Rocco Miller from Bracteer.org, and Matt Sikowski down on the bottom row there. Uh, thanks for joining us, and we will be talking to you again real soon.